want to talk today about what I call the paradox of the fundamental right to property in the Indian constitution. Now, there's a familiar narrative about the fundamental right to property, which is taught in our law schools, at least since the time I went to law school about 10 years ago. But I don't think things have changed very much since then. And it goes something like this. The Indian constitution, when it was adopted in 1950, guaranteed fundamental right to property in Articles 191F and 31. However, these provisions were enforced by a reactionary and pro-property rights Supreme Court to protect the rights of rich property owners, particularly zamindars, and to impede the parliament's land reform agenda. Consequently, these provisions were amended several times by parliament during the three decades following independence and were ultimately abolished by the 44th constitutional amendment in 1978. The only other context in which law students and lawyers learn something about the right to property are in relation to the cases involving constitutional amendments, starting with Shankri Prasad Deo and finally culminating into the basic structure case. So when I started working in this area, I discovered that not only does the right to property have a checkered history, that there have been so many amendments and uh, you know the right was there in the constitution and later it was abolished, but also that there is really a profusion of scholarly literature on this topic during the decades that we did in fact have a fundamental right to property in the text of the constitution, none of which seems to find its way into our constitutional law courses today. And even though there is this scholarly literature during the decades we do have the right to property, we find that following the abolition of the right to property, scholarly literature on property rights disappears. And this happens even though a constitutional, though not a fundamental right to property, remains in the constitution in the form of Article 300A. And we, we do have significant litigation on the scope of the meaning of Article 300A that continues. So even though we, we do have this constitutional, though not a fundamental right, we do have litigation, we do have cases on this, somehow no one's writing about the right to property anymore. So the fact that discussion on this subject has disappeared both from classrooms and from journal pages means that somehow this issue is no longer regarded as one of significance, which it clearly was 65 years ago when India became independent and adopted its constitution and continued to remain until 1978 when this right was abolished. Very recently, however, there have been demands for reinstating the right to property back into the constitution. In accordance with this view, in 2009, a public interest petition was filed before the Supreme Court in the case of Sanjeev Agarwal versus Union of India, which sought to invalidate the 44th constitutional amendment and reinstate the fundamental right to property back into the constitution. In, in his case, the, uh, in his petition, the petitioner cited large scale displacement caused by the creation of special economic zones and projects like the Narmada Dam, as well as the land conflicts in Singur and Nandigram as motivating his demand for reinstatement of the fundamental right to property. In 2010, the Supreme Court dismissed the petition, but not on its merits, indicating that it, the petition may be refiled in a more appropriate case. So it is against this backdrop that my work tries to tell the story of why the fundamental right to property in India has had such a checkered history. But because property and property law is central to the way that our economic, social, and political relations are organized. In telling this story, I hope also to piece together a narrative of the broader social, political, and economic structure that we devised for ourselves post-independence and how that has changed with the changes that we have made to our property laws and property relations, including uh, the amendments to the right to property and its, consequent, uh, and its subsequent abolition. So the question with any story is, how should I go about telling this story? And there, you know, I, I, I think Lewis Carroll's advice in The Adventures of Alice in Wonderland is, is helpful, that about, you know, at some point in the, story, in the story, the king tells the rabbit that the best way to tell a story properly is to begin at the beginning. And the beginning of my story lies in the drafting of the constitutional property clause. So going back to that, we find that the Constituent Assembly debated both the inclusion as well as the content 
of a fundamental right to property for two and a half years before adopting the constitutional property provisions that it did. So significant and fundamental was this debate that it began very early in the Constituent Assembly, even while the terms of independence were being worked out. And the controversy on this subject was more prolonged and acute than that of over any other subject, except the choice of official languages. The final provision that was adopted in Article 31 was modeled on Section 299 of the Government of India Act of 1935, but there were certain key differences that greatly strengthened the protection of certain kinds of property rights and also weakened the protection of other kinds of property rights in post-independent India. And yet, despite these deliberations by India's wisest men and women, well, mostly men at that time, but there were some women, we ended up with a property clause that politicians and scholars argued repeatedly throughout the first three decades needed to be constantly amended to give effect to the Constituent Assembly's intentions. It is very puzzling that men of the stature of B.N. Rao, who drafted the text of the Indian Constitution, or B.R. Ambedkar, who was the chairman of the drafting committee, Jawala Nehru, India's first prime minister, and Sardar Patel, India's first home minister, men whom we respect greatly for their talent and intellect, and some of whom I've grown to respect even more the more I've read about them, it is puzzling that they should end up drafting a property clause, which they and many others had deliberated upon for a period of two and a half years that did not give effect to their intentions. So it is, it is this puzzle that I sort of try to understand in my work, and my conclusion on that is that the answer to this puzzling question is twofold. First, it lies in the paradoxical nature of the constitutional property clause, which I will explain in a minute what I mean, mean by that. And second, it perhaps lies in the rather obvious explanation that if the constitutional property clause did not give effect to the Constituent Assembly's intentions, then perhaps it was because there was no consensus within the Assembly on what those intentions were or should be. Before I return to the first explanation about the paradoxical nature of the Constitutional Property Clause, I want to give you a sense of, uh, of the Indian Constitution and what was really happening at the time that it was being drafted. For the leaders of the Indian independence struggle, the adoption of a constitution constituting a sovereign, democratic, secular republic was the first important step in marking a break from the past of colonial domination and subordination. However, in addition to the desire to control their political destiny, the Indian independence movement was also driven by the desire to achieve a new social and economic order premised on rapid economic development and social redistribution. The first constitution of a Commonwealth country to be drafted entirely by its own nationals, the Indian constitution was and remains the longest written constitution of a sovereign nation. The length of the constitution is perhaps a reflection of the magnitude of problems facing the nation at the time of independence. These included its very integration and consolidation as a nation state, the need to reassure minorities following the trauma of partition, the desperate poverty of the vast majority of our masses, the low rates of economic growth, and pervasive practices of social and religious discrimination. The organization of property relations in India, or rather reorganization of property relations in India following independence, was at the heart of achieving solutions to all of these problems. The question before the Constituent Assembly, therefore, was how should we ensure the transition to a liberal democratic legal order, which guaranteed to everyone in a society that was deeply divided on the basis of caste, religion, gender, etc.? How should we guarantee to people in this deeply divided society the rights to liberty, equality, and property, while simultaneously embarking on a transformation of the economic and social order, which was considered by the leaders of the time, particularly Nehru, as imperative to prevent a violent revolution? So it was not just that the Constituent Assembly wanted to pursue these twin goals of achieving a liberal democracy, with social and economic transformation, 
But in fact, they were very keenly aware that economic and social transformation was indispensable to achieving liberal democracy. This transformation was pegged on a development strategy involving a move from a feudal agrarian to a capital-intensive industrial society. A major component of this transformative agenda was land reform, involving zamidari abolition and redistribution of land amongst the peasants, something that many leaders within the Congress had championed for at least two or more decades before independence. Equally important, however, was state-planned industrial growth and encouragement of the growth of private industry. Thus, there was a paradox implicit in guaranteeing a fundamental right to property. And so I return back to my first explanation of why is it that everyone claimed that the, cons the constitutional property clause did not actually give effect to the intentions of the, the drafters, and which is why they had to keep amending it, is because there was a, an implicit paradox in, in guaranteeing a fundamental right to property, which conserved existing entitlements, while simultaneously embarking on a socialist developmental project of land reform and state plan industrial growth that necessitated altering existing property arrangements. Not surprisingly then, this inherent paradox led to intense debate within the assembly on the contours of the constitutional property clause. It also perhaps foreshadowed the tensions that arose later between the legislature and the executive on the one hand that sought to implement this development agenda and the judiciary on the other, which enforced the fundamental right to property of those affected. In accordance with the prevailing intellectual currents, the Constituent Assembly perceived itself as charged with the task of balancing the interests of the individual with those of the community. In September 1949, speaking in the Constituent Assembly, Nehru stated that there were two different approaches to drafting the right to property. One was from the point of view of the individual's right to property, and the other was from the point of view of the community's interest or right in that property. But he believed, and so did many others in the Constituent Assembly, that these two approaches did not necessarily conflict with each other, and so that they would be able to come up with a clause that balanced both these interests. In the Assembly were also represented various competing interests. On one end of the spectrum were the zamidars and industrialists who sought full protection for their property interests, and failing that, payment of market value compensation for acquisition of their property. On the other end of the spectrum were the democratic socialists, and while well, the communists were not represented in the assembly, but uh, they would agree with the socialists on, on these goals, Nehru was one of them, the democratic socialists, who wanted zamidari abolition without compensation, land redistribution, and nationalization of key industries, all of which, all of which measures militated against the uh, recognition of a fun fundamental right to property in the Constitution. And finally, also represented in the Constitution were those who believed that property rights, particularly those of industry, should be protected even as they believed in the legitimacy of zamidari abolition. So there were all these competing interests. There was this idea that you have to balance the individual uh, interest in property with that of the social. And then finally, the debates took place within overarching discourses that again emphasized different values. These included debates on the importance of liberal democracy versus socialism, constitutional versus parliamentary forms of government, the scope and limits of judicial review, and economic development with its corresponding focus on greater agricultural productivity and, and rapid industrial growth. So it was through a conscious process of balancing of the interests of the individual and the community, framed within these overarching discourses that I've just mentioned, that the drafters adopted Articles 191F and 31. And what did these provisions say? Article 191F guaranteed to all citizens the fundamental right to acquire, hold, and dispose of property. Article 196 made this right subject to reasonable restrictions in the public interest by the union and state legislatures. So thereby, uh, the, thereby um, including the community's interest in the property by restricting the individual's right to property. And finally, Article 31 provided that the state could acquire property, but any such acquisition must only be upon, first, the enactment of a valid law, second, for a public purpose, and third, upon payment of compensation.
It was this provision that I mentioned, which was modeled on Section 299 of the Government of India Act, with exceptions for zamindari abolition laws, certain zamindari abolition laws. Article 31 was essentially drafted with a view to reaching a just compromise between the competing interests. So essentially, there were no common interests represented in the Constituent Assembly beyond the desire that there has to be a balancing between the rights of the individual and those of the community, and the fact that a majority of people believed that Zamidari had to go. So, and it, therefore, what, what we end up with is a compromise where the views of the last group, that is those who believe that property rights, particularly those of industry, should be protected, even as they believed in the legitimacy of Zamidari abolition. It was their views that were ultimately reflected in this compromise that was reached. The distinction between Zamidari and industrial property reflected in the compromise in Article 31 was derived from the prevailing development discourse in the post-war period, with its focus on economic growth through greater industrialization and capital formation. Let me say a little bit about the development discourse. Um, development theory as we know it has its origins pretty much around uh, the 40s in the, in the post-war period, because before that, no one was uh, you know, talking about uh, development as, as something that can be achieved through following particular models. But suddenly, it was uh, in the post-war period, more or less, or a little bit before that, when it was believed that actually the colonies that were now emerging uh, as independent nations, if they only followed what had happened in the Western world, if they followed those models, that it would be able to achieve rapid economic progress. And, and, and that has continued over the last 60 odd years. It's just that the, uh, and it's just that there have been uh, dominant models at various points in time about what is uh, the ideal development path to follow. So, and this and those vary from uh, um, from greater industrialization and capital formation in the immediate post-war period to state-led industrial growth, and then later on to to, to socialism and then to neoliberalism today. So there are changes in what is perceived as the dominant mode of development within development theory. That doesn't mean that there's never been disagreement about this. There's always been disagreements, but there's always also been um, a sort of dominant model that is put forth. And at this point in time, uh, in the post-war period, the, the, the dominant model was the idea that through greater industrialization and capital formation, that's the way forward for developing countries. And so uh, the adoption of such a strategy of economic development, which was based on the rejection of feudal tenure systems in an agrarian society, so the Zamidari system, and the acceptance of what Nehru called a mixed economy, capitalist model of development and an industrial society. So the adoption of such a strategy of development required protection of the property rights of industry, even as it required that the feudal systems had to be abolished. Predictably, however, such a compromise failed to please both the Zamidars and the socialists and merely shifted the battle arena from the Constituent Assembly to the courts. The following decades, therefore, saw conflict between Parliament and the Supreme Court, with the court invalidating acquisition laws for violating the fundamental right to property, and Parliament responding with numerous amendments to the Constitution that redefine property rights. As I mentioned before, this conflict culminated in the 44th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished the fundamental right to property in 1978. The same amendment, however, inserted Article 300A into the Constitution, which provides that no person shall be deprived of his or her property without the authority of a valid law. In conclusion, I would say that the Constituent Assembly faced an extremely difficult, perhaps impossible task of reconciling different competing interests within the overarching discursive frameworks of liberal democracy versus socialism, constitutional versus parliamentary forms of government, and economic development, with its focus on greater agricultural productivity and industrial growth. The constitutional property clause as drafted was an attempt at reaching a just compromise, a compromise that clearly favored certain kinds of property rights over others. It was left to the courts to resolve the inevitable conflicts that came up when those who had been disempowered or deprioritized by the Assembly and later Parliament sought to enforce the guarantees that they had been given in the text of the Constitution. The Court's role in this process is as complex and nuanced 
as that of the Constituent Assembly. And in many ways, they were also operating within the same discourses that engaged the drafters, particularly in terms of balancing liberal, democratic, and social values and achieving a balance between the rights of the individual versus the rights of the community. It is clear from my reading of the cases that the conventional, rather simplistic narrative of the court as defending the rights of rich property owners is at best incomplete and at worst misleading. A detailed analysis of the court's decisions on property rights is necessary for shedding light on how the court conducted this balancing exercise before we judge the court as being reactionary or pro-property rights. But that is a very detailed and involved discussion that might well be suited to a separate session. Thank you.